Hello, and welcome to this eSchool Media webcast. My name's Andrew Barber. I'm a senior contributing editor here at eSchool Media, and I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation, which is sponsored by It's Learning. Now, over the next hour or so, we'll be looking at strategies and tools that can help schools use technology to support pedagogical practices in K-12 classrooms. Now, before I introduce our speaker for today, I do just want to take a few moments to highlight a couple of things about the console that you're looking at uh, right now. Uh, first, uh, today's event will be recorded, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. In, in a couple of days, we'll send everyone an email that's going to contain a link to the recorded event, and you'll also be able to download a PDF of the presentation, you know, the slide deck from that same email. And second, please ask questions. Don't feel as if you have to wait until the end at, at any point during the presentation. If you have a question, just type it into the Q&A console, uh, into the Q&A box, sorry, on your console and hit the submit button. And I hope we'll have 10 or 15 minutes at the end when our speaker can answer your questions. We also have a chat function, which you can launch from that blue group chat icon down at the bottom of your screen. And please use chat to talk among yourselves or to contact me or the eSchool Media team with any technical issues or any other concerns that you might have. Um, but please do me a favor and don't use the chat function to ask our speaker questions. Uh, she simply isn't going to have time to monitor the chats. Uh, for that, please use the Q&A panel instead. And with that out of the way, let me formally uh, introduce our speaker for today. Jennifer Gonzalez is an author and a national board certified teacher who taught language arts in middle schools, both on the East Coast and in the Midwest. She's also editor in chief at Cult of Pedagogy, an online magazine dedicated to helping teachers become better teachers. At the Cult of Pedagogy, she blends her broad teaching and technical knowledge to help educators and trainers improve and find more fulfillment in their daily work. Welcome, Jennifer. It's a real pleasure to have you here today. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. You're I welcome. am going. Oh, thank you. I didn't know there was a delay in us in us as well. Um, was there anything else that you needed to say before I get started? No, your floor is yours. Okay. I just want to thank everybody who's who's in the webinar right now for coming. Um, I'm going to try not to overwhelm you with too much because I feel like I could share about twice as much as what I've gotten here today, but I feel like quality is better than quantity. So let's just begin with this, this laptop, this slim piece of metal and glass, this board of wires and connections. On its own, it does nothing. But put it in the hands of people and it can do marvelous things. People like teachers. Long before technology became such an integral part of, of our lives, teachers brought a unique set of skills and talents into classrooms every day. They had and still have qualities that no technology could ever replace. They show up every day with a contagious passion for their subject area. They show up with an inspiring enthusiasm for learning and an intuition about people and what they need at any given moment. These are things that technology can offer. Teachers also have a deep understanding of pedagogy. You can tell which students are having trouble understanding and what you can do in response to that. You know what kind of instructional strategy would work best to teach what kind of material. You know when to let students struggle on their own, when it's best to step in. You also have the ability to choose just the right resource at the right time. These are things technology definitely can't offer. Finally, teachers provide things that only come in human packaging. You have a sense of humor. You have a growing knowledge of your students' individual personalities, their backgrounds, and their needs. And you also have warmth and approachability. These are things technology definitely can't offer. But put tools to 
together with humans, put the right tools in the hands of a teacher who already has all of these incredible skills and talents, that's when the teacher becomes empowered, when the tech takes the teaching to a whole new level. In this webinar, we're going to look at four specific ways technology can empower you as a teacher, how it can add more rigor to your instruction, how it can add more customization in student learning, how it can give you more high-quality connections with students, parents, and colleagues, and how it can give you more time to do the things you're uniquely qualified to do. So the first thing, actually, not yet, uh, as we work through this webinar, I just want to make sure that you know that in the bottom left corner of your screen where it says resource list, there's a PDF handout that you can download. This includes links to all the tools that I'm going to go over in this webinar. So you don't need to try to find these websites or anything. They're all going to be included in that download. So the first big difference thoughtfully chosen tech can make to your instruction is more rigor. In other words, adding some key pieces of technology can actually raise the cognitive level of some of your lessons. We're going to look at three different categories of tech tools that can really boost the level of learning in your classroom. The first is curation tools. Second group is mind mapping tools. And then the third group is infographics tools. So we're going to start by taking a look at curation tools. First of all, let's talk a little bit about what the word curation even means. This is the act of gathering, selecting, and organizing resources around a unifying theme, and then sharing that collection with others. Curation is what a museum director does when they decide they want to exhibit artifacts from you know, a time period in history. Uh, curation is what somebody who makes a playlist does. It's what somebody who uh, creates a list of the 10 best movies of the year. That act is curation. And if we can get our students to start doing some curating, this is actually a higher level task. Right now, one of the most commonly used tools for curation is Pinterest. Tons of educators already use tools like Pinterest to curate their own resources. But we could also use a tool like Pinterest to assign curation projects to students. So here's what a Pinterest board might look like if students were actually using it for an academic project. Having students curate resources in our content area requires them to make decisions. It requires them to analyze, differentiate, and make value judgments about the items they select. If students are also required to write about why they selected each item or identify key characteristics in the resource, the assignment gets even more rigorous. And the best part is this kind of project doesn't have to be very time consuming. Is it possible for students to do the same thing without using technology? Absolutely. However, they would need to spend quite a lot of time on non-academic tasks, such as cutting, pasting, shopping for supplies. When we use digital curation tools, they can assemble their collection with a few clicks, they can make changes easily, and they never have to print a single sheet of paper. So we've already looked at Pinterest as a possible tool. Let's go ahead and look at a few more. One of my favorite curation tools is called eLink. And the reason I like it so much is because it is so simple. You just paste in the URLs of whatever online resource you want to collect such as articles, images, videos, or you could even be collecting whole websites. And then you add your own commentary about the resource. What you end up with is a unique web page that houses all of those links under a single title, along with handcrafted descriptions that you, the curator, added yourself. And so instead of just a bunch of links, which you could throw together in sort of like a Google Doc or an email, uh, eLink will pull in the images and the title and, and just make it look really attractive. 
so it makes it really nice to sort of browse through and enjoy these resources on a single website. So I find this format to be really flexible, and just having students put together an e-link of curated resources on a given topic would make a great assignment all on its own. Another tool that I like a lot is called TAC. This is similar to e-link in that you do gather resources onto a single website, but what's different about TAC is that many of these resources can be embedded directly onto the page. So in the e-link we just looked at, if you were going to include a video, you would have an image there, but when someone clicked on it, they would take, be taken over to YouTube to watch the video. On TAC, the video is actually embedded right here on the screen. So this makes it possible to create a really rich multimedia experience on any given topic. Something to keep in mind about curation is that these offer some really good opportunities for student collections. But these tools would also be really good for teachers to curate our own resources. If you're gathering articles, images, and videos for a unit of study, collecting them on a TAC board keeps them all together, and it makes them really enjoyable to consume. So one more tool I wanted to look at is called DIGO. This is D-I-I-G-O. DIGO is a much plainer, more text-focused curation tool. It gives the user lots of room to create outlines of their topic and then add in links to resources. And you can see that these links are not pretty like they are in the other uh, two tools. But this is a really good tool for more text-driven research and that sort of thing. Supposing this, is, this would be something that would be great for someone who's working on a master's project or something, or for um, high school students who are doing more of a long-term research project where they have to do, uh, gather a lot of resources. They can build outlines and embed links to their resources right there. But Digo also has another feature that I think makes it really, really unique. It allows you to put your own highlights and comments right on the web pages that you curate. No one else can actually see these. If they were to go to those websites, they wouldn't see your highlights. But when you click on your own link from Digo and they send you to that page, all of your marks and comments are going to appear there for you. They'll be waiting and saved for you there. So this makes doing deep research and citing a variety of sources incredibly easy. So we've looked at curation tools. The next set of tools that we're going to look at that helps to build more rigor into lessons are mind mapping tools. Anytime we visualize the concepts we're trying to teach, we automatically improve learning. So tools that allow us to more easily create these visualizations really be powerful for delivering instruction. And having students use visual tools to organize content, demonstrate learning, or plan projects is a higher order task in and of itself. Each of the tools in this section can facilitate that kind of visual mind mapping. One of these tools is called Coggle. This is actually the simplest of the three that I'm going to show you, because Coggle mind maps work best when you stick to just words and branches. They do have the ability to add links and images, but it ends up looking very, very sloppy. So if you're going to use Coggle, I'd say use it for something very simple. So if you wanted students to make connections between lots of words, groups of words, and broad concepts, but you didn't really want them to pull in a lot of multimedia, Coggle would be a great tool for that, for creating a fast mind map. And what's nice about this tool and the other mind mapping tools is because they're cloud-based, because they live online, students can work on them for a while, they can go away, they can come back to them and continue to build, and all of their work is saved. They also all allow for collaboration. So two students, three students, they can all work on the same mind map together. Another really nice mind mapping tool is called Poplet. With Poplet, the user can connect topics and subtopics just like they do in Coggle. Um, but you can also include images and links to outside resources. You can do these in Coggle, but it's kind of messy, like I said before. Adding these things in Poplet is just a lot easier, and it makes for a visually appealing mind map. You can also embed videos that will play right inside the Poplet. 
So there's just a lot of potential for this to be a pretty powerful learning and teaching tool. The third tool I'd like to show you in this category is called Sketchboard. What makes this tool a bit different is that the user has a lot more control over how the elements of the mind map look. So it ends up having a very similar feel to an actual hand-drawn sketch. The advantages of all of these tools, like I said before, is that they're stored in the cloud. And it's also, you know, there may be the question of why not just do this on paper. What's nice about a digital mind mapping tool is that you can change the elements and rearrange them without having to erase like you would on a physical piece of paper or start over again. And sometimes when we're trying to get our concepts or our thoughts into some sort of a visual representation, we end up wanting to do a lot of rearranging until it's just right or until the, the hierarchy of the elements really makes sense. So having this stuff in a digital form makes that rearranging a lot faster and easier than it would be if you were trying to do this over and over again on paper. So the last category in the rigor section um, are the infographics tools. Our current standards ask students to do some pretty focused work with the relationships between words and images. We ask them to represent data in visual forms, to interpret data in charts, graphs, and tables. So if we can give them some experience with infographics, both reading them and creating them, it's going to help our students better understand those kinds of relationships. So the first tool in the infographics, and I've just got two of them to show you in this category, is called Pictochart, where users are given templates to work from along with various icons to represent ideas and graphic options for representing numbers. This is just one example of how someone took a set of statistics and packaged it in a way that was not only a lot more eye-catching than a flat collection of numbers, but it also makes the meaning of the numbers come alive with images and other design features. The thinking required to put something like this together is actually quite complex because the student has to make decisions about what figures will make the biggest impact on the reader and how these figures should be displayed and arranged so that the reader understands them right away. So, you know, the end product is something that looks fairly simple, but we're really talking about some pretty higher order thinking going on to create something like this. Another tool that's great for creating infographics is called Infogram, and this is just one example of the type of thing, but their, their infographics also can get just as complex looking as the one I just showed you. Once students learn how to create these representations and they start using them to support arguments, or to illustrate their own research, they end up becoming better equipped to notice and interpret similar data visualizations in their own reading and their own research. So we just looked at how technology can give us more rigor in our instruction. The second way that technology can give us advantages is more customization, or as we like to call it in schools, differentiation. We're going to look at three different kinds of tools that can help you do a better job of differentiating instruction for your students. Um, one type of tool is what I'm going to be calling self-paced learning tools. Another is differentiated content libraries. And then the third is what we'll call accessibility tools. So we'll start with what I'm calling self-paced learning tools. And actually, I'm just going to be talking in this case about one particular kind of self-paced learning tool. It's that good. <laughs> it's called a playlist. Actually, it's got two names. I'm going to start with playlist. A playlist is one of the simplest pieces of technology, but it packs a lot of power. Basically, this is a Google Doc that lists out all the steps a student needs to take in a unit with hyperlinks to the resources they need to complete each assignment. So we're going to take a closer look at this one. You can see in task number four, students are being sent to a screencast video to watch. They also get a link to an assignment sheet that details the requirements for that particular task. 
Step 5 has students browse a few articles to help them come up with a topic for their essay. In that same step, they're told to check in with their teacher once they've chosen a topic. Playlists can include physical, face-to-face -face activities as well as digital ones. It's really just a system of organizing a whole unit ahead of time so that students can work their way through it at their own pace. What's nice about these playlists is that because this teacher works inside Google Classroom, each student gets an individual copy. So the teacher can go in and make adjustments to different students' playlists depending on their needs or interests. Now, for this one, I don't have a link to any one particular kind of online tool. Um, but what I can share is an interview that I did with the teacher who created the playlist you're looking at. This is Tracy Enos. She's a middle school teacher. Uh, she teaches language arts in Rhode Island. And in the download PDF, you'll find a link to a blog post that shows um, more of her playlist and then a podcast interview that I did with her where she t walks me through how she actually creates these playlists and uses them to deliver differentiated instruction. Another term for this kind of online hyperlink document is a hyperdoc. This term was coined by teachers Lisa Highfield, Kelly Hilton, and Sarah Landis. You can learn more about how to create these at their website, hyperdocs.co, where they offer a big library of teacher-created hyperdocs and free templates you can use to create your own. So another kind of tool that you can use to build more customization into the learning for your students is what I'm calling differentiated content libraries. And that's kind of a name I made up because I was trying to figure out how to describe these websites. And that was the best thing I could come up with. A couple of really great websites have come along in recent years that do just one thing well. They collect content that we can use in our classrooms. And the two that I'm the two that I'm going to show you here have some pretty neat features that also help you get a more customized learning experience for each of your students. Sorry, I forgot the button. Okay, the first one is called Newzella. Some people say this website, News ELA. Newzella is just incredible. It houses a collection of news articles. These are texts that are pulled from current news sources like the Associated Press, the New York Times. Newzella starts with the original article, and then they rewrite it four times, gradually simplifying the reading level with every rewrite. When a student loads up the article, they can either read it at its original reading level, or they can choose a lower level with simpler vocabulary and sentence structure. When a teacher has a tool like Newzella, they can provide the same content to a highly diverse group of students, but have each student reading at just the right level for them. Another powerful way to use a tool like Newzella is to teach students how to monitor their own comprehension. So instead of insisting that students read on the level we prescribe to them, we could work toward a classroom norm where each student chooses a level that's most appropriate for him or her and let them toggle back and forth between levels if necessary until they feel confident that they understand the text. So ideally, we would really put the power of these tech tools into students' hands. Another tool is ListenWise. ListenWise is a website that offers a huge collection of curated public radio broadcasts. Well, they're podcasts, sorted by topic. So they're very easy to find in terms of what you're looking for, or what content you're teaching, and what things you might want to supplement with. These high-quality podcasts can be used for a variety of content areas. The way that this serves as a customized tool is that along with the audio for each podcast, ListenWise provides an interactive transcript which students can follow along with while they listen. And so the words light up as you hear them. The site also allows you to slow down the audio just a bit to make it easier to comprehend the language. So these kinds of features make ListenWise an outstanding support tool for English language learners or struggling readers. Again, 
like with Newzella, the power of a tool like this can be extended if students are allowed to experiment with the supports, to understand that they are available and how they work, and then try consuming the content with and without them until they find a combination of scaffolds that works just right for them. If students are given the opportunity to develop that kind of self-awareness and self-determination, they'll take that skill out into the rest of their academic and professional careers. It's a skill that will serve them well as lifelong learners. Finally, the third way that tech can give us more customization is with accessibility tools. And we're just going to look at two right now. One of them is called Natural Reader. Natural Reader is a tool that will read aloud just about any text you give it, a PDF, a Word document, a website, an ebook, even handwritten text. This is free software. It's a free software download for Windows or Mac, uh, and they also have a web-based version and a browser bookmark, allowing you to have any web page read to you. When you have this tool on hand, it's going to be helpful to students who prefer to hear information rather than read it, English language learners, students with visual impairments, or really any student. You know, we, we have you know, our, our large class lists and we get our um, notifications of which students have accommodations and which students have IEPs, and sometimes that can make us as teachers tend to think that only some of our students actually need these extra supports. But, you know, there's a concept called universal design for learning, and basically the idea of that is that we should be designing our learning experiences to make them more accessible for any student, regardless of what their abilities are. We should be trying to remove barriers. So we may find that we have students in our class that just prefer to hear things instead of uh, read them, or they might prefer that sometimes over other times. And so offering tools like Natural Reader, it just helps them get to know themselves better as learners and basically learn how to advocate for themselves and uh, choose tools that are going to help them. So one other accessibility tool is called Read and Write, and that is all one word, Read and Write. Read and Write is actually kind of a big company, but they've got a Chrome extension. Uh, it's, just, it's just a toolbar you can add to your Chrome browser. And it does basically a lot of the same things that Natural Reader does. It allows you to um, highlight any text and hear it read aloud. You can hear it read aloud at different speeds. It can also transcribe your speech into text. So that would make this a really wonderful uh, tool for struggling readers and writers. If you've got students, I was a language arts teacher, and a lot of times I had students who would say that they couldn't write, you know, but they sure could talk. <laughs> and so. And they love to tell stories about themselves, and they love to argue. And so if I could teach them how to just talk out the stuff that I wanted them to write, then that could kind of help them get over the hump. If I had had a tool like Read and Write where they could just sort of dictate their story and it would be transcribed, and then they could go in and fix the places where it was like, no, oh, this one, that's not exactly how I meant to say it or I need to punctuate it. But just to be able to get those thoughts out could be such a fantastic support. And obviously, it would also be a wonderful support for students with special needs as well. So the third way technology can empower you as a teacher is by giving you more connection to other people. Even though many people are concerned that our devices are causing us to interact less with one another, if we use them correctly, some tools can actually give us connections we might never have had with students, parents, and other teachers. So we're going to look at two types of tools that can really help us with these connections. One type of tool is social media, and another type is what I'm just calling collaboration tools, and these are tools that actually help us to collaborate better with each other. So I'm sure most of us here have had plenty of experience already with social media. But we might only be using platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter in our personal lives. Social media actually offers some incredible ways to connect with others in our role as teachers. And by taking advantage of these, we can build relationships that simply wouldn't be possible otherwise. So let's start by looking at Twitter chats. Just in case you're not sure what that is, a Twitter chat is where a group of Twitter users 
start tweeting with the same hashtag at a mutually agreed upon time and day. So you're basically saying, I will meet you on the internet at this time. And by using that same hashtag, they can follow each other's tweets and basically have a live conversation online. So this is just a really, really small snapshot that we're looking at here of a Twitter chat. In this very brief exchange, one of the people in this group here is in Minnesota. One of them is in New Jersey, and the other is in the Dominican Republic. And these people all got together <laughs> this past Sunday, and they got on Twitter for uh, something that's called Sun Chat. And if you look closely, you'll see that every single one of their tweets has the hashtag Sun Chat. This is just a Sunday morning chat for educators. So they got together and talked about how to make grading practices more effective. So this conversation went on a lot longer than the piece we're looking at here, and it also involved a lot more people. It covered a lot of other topics, but this just gives you a quick snapshot of how a Twitter chat works. And there are hundreds of Twitter chats happening between educators every week. So if you show up for one, this is a great way to exchange ideas quickly with others who share your interests from all over the world. So. <laughs> How do you actually find them? Um, I want to show you, uh, or I'm going to give you a link to a website that is created by somebody named Jerry Blumengarten. His website is cyberryman.com. Jerry keeps an updated list of education Twitter chats, and he does a really good job of keeping up with this list. Like It's, it's pretty current. Um, on this same website, he provides helpful tips for getting started. So if you're not exactly sure how does it work, how do you join a Twitter chat, which by the way, there's no need to be invited or anything. You literally just show up and people are very welcoming. So if you were to click on the official Twitter education chat schedule right there, uh, then you'll actually be taken to a list of chats. He keeps this list by day and, and time and everything. So this is just a small section of the list that's kept by Jerry Blumengarten. Um, what we're looking at is Thursday nights around 8 p.m. Eastern time. In just this small time frame, we can see a chat for secondary English language arts teachers. We can see one for fifth grade teachers. There's a chat for those interested in project-based learning. And there's a chat just for North Carolina educators. So people group themselves up in all different kinds of ways so that they can find other people who are passionate about the same things they are. Another excellent way to connect with other educators online is through Facebook groups. These groups are just as specialized as the Twitter chats with teachers coming together to share ideas and resources or work through tough classroom problems. This is one that is specifically for math teachers who use the game Breakout EDU. So it's very, very specialized. Members post questions and requests for help and resources, and other group members chime in and help out. Unlike a Twitter chat, which can be very fast moving, Facebook groups move at a much more comfortable pace, and you can jump in at any time to post a question to the whole group. In the PDF that I mentioned before that you can download over there on the left-hand side of your screen, um, I share a link to this article, which gives you 20 different groups you might be interested in. These are different Facebook groups. If that list doesn't have what you're looking for, another way to find a group that shares your interest is to just do a search on Facebook. As long as you use the word group in your search, so you know, if you're looking for you know, chemistry teachers group, you could put something like that. And then make sure that the group you join is actually listed as a group and not a page or a community. This is because groups, as far as how Facebook defines them, um, they usually allow members to create their own posts that are visible to everyone. And these will basically just give you the most opportunities for interaction with other people. So the last social media platform I want to talk about is Instagram. Plenty of teachers have their own personal Instagram accounts, but some teachers also have class accounts. These give parents a window into what their kids are doing in school, and they help parents feel more connected to the classroom. 
right now we're looking at a post from the Instagram account of Top Dog Kids. This is the third grade class of North Dakota teacher Kayla Delter. This is a student-run account. Every day a different student gets a turn to be the Instagrammer of the day, and that student creates a post to share what the class is doing that day. This is just an awesome way to share what the class is doing, help parents feel like they're part of the classroom, and really also just give students ownership of that process. Kayla does a lot of work um, showing students how to use social media responsibly, um, you know, how to, how to write things in a way that's going to be clear to the audience so they're thinking about, you know, who they're writing for. And she's done a very good job of sort of, you know, taking her hands off and letting it be run by the kids and yet still teaching them and supervising them so that they're really making the, the best use of it. I'm, I'm linking you also to an article that she wrote. This is Kayla Delter again. Um, three reasons students should own your classroom's Twitter and Instagram accounts. One of the things she shares in this article is um, when she gets these accounts started at the beginning of the year, first she trains the students in how to use the platforms, but then she has a parent boot camp where she invites parents to come to the school and the students actually help their parents set up their own accounts. They show them how to follow the class accounts. They teach them about things like hashtags and how to like a post or how to comment on a post. And so I thought having that kind of a structure was just a really wonderful way to make sure that if you're going to make the effort to have a class social media account, that parents are actually going to use it. So. Another way that technology can foster stronger connections is with collaboration tools. And again, this is just a term that I made up. This is not anything that's official. These are just websites and apps that make it a lot easier for people to communicate and collaborate in meaningful ways. So this one I think may be the most obvious, but the free apps inside Google Drive have so much collaboration power that I have to at least mention it. In Google Drive, users can not only create documents, slideshows, drawings, and spreadsheets, but Google also gives all users the ability to share these files with other users. Once you've shared a file with another user, they can comment on it. If you give them editing privileges, they can even edit it. So this just allows students to collaborate and connect anytime in school or outside of it. So I definitely don't want to spend a lot of time talking about Google Tools or Google Drive only because I feel like it's catching on so much that this is sort of an, an obvious one, but I would feel remiss if I didn't mention it at least. So here's one that you may not have heard of. This one's not quite as well known yet. This is called Slack. Slack is a discussion platform that is quickly taking over email in a lot of companies, and it could do the same in schools. Slack works kind of like Facebook groups where you have an account and you create different conversation threads with different people. These are called channels. So for example, your school could have one channel that the whole staff belongs to. And anyone who wants to send a message out to the whole staff would do so on that channel. <clears throat> you could also have different channels for your grade level or department and then others for special projects you're working on. What's great about Slack is that unlike emails, which have to be opened up one by one before you can read their contents, and then you, know, you open them and they've got these long, confusing reply all threads to keep track of, and you're scrolling through trying to figure out which message came before which and who said what, Slack just keeps the whole conversation visible to everyone who's in it, and it's just one nice, clean thread. Slack would not only be an excellent tool to better collaborate with your colleagues, and it could also replace some of your time-consuming meetings, it would also be a great platform for student groups. So as a teacher, you could set up the groups and then easily observe how well students are participating in each group. The last collaboration tool I'd like to share here is called Voxer. Now this one has become such an essential part of my own life, I can't imagine how I'd get by without it. Voxer is a messaging app that you keep on your phone. It's a lot like Slack in that you have different discussion threads going with different people, except in Voxer you use your voice. Just press play 
on the first one, and then they will all play one after the other in the order they were put there. So why is this so great? Because text has its limits. The voice can communicate things you just can't get with words alone. And sometimes it's just faster to say something. The other reason Voxer is so much more effective than, say, a phone call is that Voxer chats are asynchronous. No one has to be in the room at the same time, and everyone can contribute whenever they have a chance. This ability to carry on a discussion with a group of people, with everyone participating when they can, rather than trying to find a time when they can all be in the same place, that's priceless for busy people. Just like with Slack, this tool could be a huge game changer for teachers and their colleagues because it could replace meetings. It could also be an outstanding tool for student discussion groups. The last way technology can really empower you as a teacher is by giving you more time to do the things that you are uniquely qualified to do. This swings back to what I was talking about at the beginning, about all of those things that only actual live human teachers are capable of doing things technology just can't replicate. What tech can do is save you a ton of time on some of the tasks that can be done by a machine so that you have more time to use your special talents and skills to engage with students, build relationships, and make all of the thousands of important decisions you need to make every day. We're going to look at three kinds of tech tools that can give you this time. Parent engagement tools, planning tools, and screencasting tools. And if you're not sure what screencasting is, I am going to explain it. So the first is parent engagement tools. These tools help teachers communicate with parents in all the ways we usually do, but in a fraction of the time. Although quite a few options exist, we're going to look at two specific ones today as examples of what these kind of tools can do for you. The first is signup.com. This is a tool I wish my kids' teachers would use. I wish they would all use it. Instead of using reply all emails to recruit parent volunteers, using a tool like signup.com will save you hours of time and stress. You just create an activity, say it's a class party. You list the times that you need volunteers to come in or items that you need donated, and then you send all parents a link to that page. And from there, parents sign up for the items or the, the things that they're going to bring or the times they can come in, and you don't have to mess with it anymore. The slots get filled up, the parents see the ones that are still available, and then they take care of it. And signup.com also allows you to collect money through the site, which means that parents can send in field trip money, gift contributions, or any other donations online in just a few clicks. Even if you don't personally use this, please pass it on to your parent-teacher association coordinator or anybody that, that works with parents. They will, they will thank you for it. Another tool is Blooms. Blooms does some of the things that signup.com does, but a whole lot more. This is an online, all-in-one platform for parent communication. So in a, a single tool, teachers can stay in touch with parents. Uh, they can send announcements. You can create a shared calendar for important events. You can share videos and photos of things that are happening in the classroom. You can use those photos and videos to build student portfolios. Just like with signup.com, you can also coordinate volunteers and donations. And you can also schedule parent-teacher conferences with just a few clicks. Finally, you can track behavior and share that information with parents right through the platform. By the way, that is a free tool. The other type of tool is planning tools. One of these is called PlanBoard. Most teachers already use some kind of tool for planning lessons and units. Maybe your district has its own template or you write it in a physical plan book. Maybe you collect everything in a Word document. But if you can use an app like PlanBoard, this makes the process a lot more efficient. You add detailed lesson plans in each block. You include links to outside resources right there in the plan. And you can even add standards right in that block with just a click of a button. PlanBoard actually keeps track of the standards that you've already covered so that you even have that on record and you don't have to continually cross things off a list. This app is available on desktop or mobile so that you can do your lesson planning basically wherever it's most convenient. The other tool I wanted to recommend for planning is Google Calendar. 
Now, if you're already using a paper calendar and it's working for you and things never fall through the cracks, then I'd say just go with that. But I switched about a year ago to all digital on Google Calendar, and it's really, really helped me to keep track of everything. Um, one of the nice features about Google Calendar is that you can send yourself reminders. I'm going to move through these bullets because we're getting close to the end of time. Um, you can set events to repeat daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly. You can separate color-coded calendars. You can set reminders. That's what I was saying before. You can send yourself email or text reminders so that you don't forget about certain events. It will remind you to, to do things. And if you have trouble remembering things, this is a really, really big help. Um, also, like the other tool that I just showed you, you can sync this onto multiple devices, so you can take care of this stuff pretty much anytime your devices are available. So the last type of tool that can save you big chunks of time is what I'm calling screencasting tools. And that's actually not just me calling it, that's what they're called. <laughs> screencasting is where you record anything you have on your computer along with your own voice narration. So all those YouTube tutorials that you see, those are recorded with screencasting. A screencasting tool can be really helpful for flipped or blended learning. Flipped learning is basically where students watch the lecture portion of their instruction at home, and then you do the homework part in school instead of you doing the direct instruction at school and having the students do homework at home. Another version of this is blended learning, where students watch some videos in, in the classroom and are also doing some hands-on work and one-on-one work, one -on -one work with the teacher in the classroom. Having pre-recorded videos where you've got your lessons recorded ahead of time, what it does is it frees you up as the teacher to be able to work with the students instead of spending your time just delivering the content. So I'm going to show you two free screencasting tools that will help you create these videos. One of them is called Screencast-O-Matic. This is a free software you download and you, get, you can do 15-minute screencasts very easily. It doesn't have a lot of great editing tools, but if you spend the $15 a year that it costs for the premium version, then you can edit your recordings a lot more easily too. Uh, the other tool that does great screencasts is called Screencastify. Uh, this is a good one if you're already working in the Google platform. Uh, this is a free extension that you add to your Chrome browser does the same thing as Screencast-O-Matic. Uh, and, and just like the other one, you can pay a little bit of money per year and get the premium version. And it can do you know, even more. So we have gone over a lot here. And the number of tools that I've shown you, it might be a bit overwhelming. There are a lot of options. And you may be wondering how you can possibly take advantage of all these opportunities at once. The key is to not try to do it all at once. Just pick one thing. Look at all of the different possibilities we've explored today and zero in on one idea, one tool to try first. Maybe it's the one you think will be the quickest and easiest to integrate into your routine, or maybe it's the one that's going to make the biggest instructional impact. But start somewhere. Choose something. Because once you've seen the power that one good tech tool can give you, you'll be unstoppable. Thank you so much for coming. And I believe now we're going to move into the Q&A portion. All right, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I mean, you've certainly given me and the audience a huge amount of information and some resources to follow up on. And, uh, and some, there are some follow-up questions that have come in from the audience. And we, we do have about you know, 12 minutes left that we'll go through as many as we can. Uh, I want to come back to uh, an early part of your of the presentation when you were talking about Pinterest. And mm -hmm. someone in the audience was saying that their district is very hesitant to let their students have access to Pinterest because they feel that they're not able to protect their students from explicit content. How, how do you handle mm -hmm. that aspect of Pinterest? Oh, that is a, that's a very good question. And, you know, gosh, I wish I had a good a good answer for that because with a tool like Pinterest, depending on the kind of search terms, see whenever I'm on Pinterest, I'm looking for education related things, so I don't come across it. But every now and then I'll really step in it and, and it kind of shocks me. Um, I think <laughs> one, way to, to, <laughs> one way to handle it is to have, especially much younger kids, is to have the experience be very, very supervised. So maybe if you're dealing with elementary age students, you would have one 
class Pinterest account. And students would access it one at a time um, with an adult nearby sort of watching so that if something objectionable comes up, the teacher is right there basically to <laughs> scuttle the student away and never mind that. I think it's also important that when we're supervising them that the students are actually using um, search terms that are not going to pull up stuff that's um, inappropriate. Um, it would also be a good idea always to sort of look into almost every tool that's grown large has thought about this and they've been asked this before. So it's always a good idea to um, to go to these tools and just look in the help in terms of I'm a teacher, student use, um, student safety, and see what kinds of supports they have built in because you may be surprised with what they've already got. Okay. Well, yeah, just maybe we could stay on the same subject. Someone in the group chat was taught, you know, during the part of the presentation when you were talking about social media and, and Twitter and and uh, and other social media platforms. Someone in the someone in the audience was pointing out that you know their school doesn't even it sort of blocks these some of these um, <laughs> platforms at school. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when you talk to schools about that kind of approach, I mean, what what do you, what do you tell people about? Uh, about that approach of blocking it, or do you do you encourage them? You know, how do you handle that? You know, I, the schools that I've seen who are really moving forward and they're, are really moving their students into what we are now 17 years into, which is the 21st century, that are really have really been successful, have almost no blocks at all. And and I've found mm -hmm. that you know some schools are just really afraid of the implications. I think probably the best way to help a school to move forward is probably a multi-tiered approach. One would be to really try to sell your administrator on the idea instead of taking an aggressive approach. Um, help that administrator to connect with other administrators where those schools are have a more open access policy. Um, and also, you know, educating the parents, because I think a lot of administrators and district superintendents are really just petrified that parents are going to come after them if something ever goes wrong. So mm -hmm. including parents in the conversation about, you know, we're thinking about allowing access to this. Let's learn about the platform. Let's all learn it together. Let's look at some of the, you know, the ways that we can protect our students. So you get more buy-in. And then another, this is almost like a stopgap thing, but I've always found that it's easier to get uh, – progress with anything like this if you ask for pilot programs. <laughs> There's a lot of value in just saying, could we try this for a week and see how it goes? So, because sometimes, you know, nobody wants to commit to long-term policy, but a lot more administrators, I think, will say yes to something if it's just a quick trial or something we're just going to try over the summer or just, you know, just to see how it goes. So, but I really okay. do think long term, your best bet is going to be to uh, to hook them up with administrators that are already doing this and show them how it's done. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, now, just coming back to, uh, I mean, the fact that you have such a wealth in just this presentation alone, you you touch on a wealth of resources and tools that people can use. The question comes to mind is how do you find all of this stuff? I mean, what you know, what blogs and and other media. Are you reading regularly that's keeping you, uh, you know, on the cutting edge of, of the tools and resources that are out there? <laughs> you know, there's a there's kind of a, a few of them. One of them that I like a lot is called Free Tech for Teachers, and the number four. This is um, Richard Burns' website, and he's been doing this for so, so long. But he blogs pretty much daily about just new tools that are out there, and he really restricts himself just to um, – to free tools, but that is a really, really good resource. Um, I have always liked the work that Vicki Davis does at Cool Cat Teacher because she, she seems to pay a lot of attention to thoughtful and safe use of technology in the classroom. That is really going to result in good learning. Um, also, it really just helps to mess around on Twitter and to just follow people on Twitter and, and see what they're doing in the classroom. So those two blogs for sure. Um, mm -hmm. are good are really good resources okay all right and and when, when you you know find a lead to a, uh, a a resource you know how do you go about about vetting the technology tools how you know, how do you put it through its paces 
and how long do you use it before you start recommending it to others? Do you have a sort of a do you have a, a guideline on how you do that? Yeah, um, I, there are a couple of steps that I'll take. I mean, one thing, and this is something we tell our students all the time, but one thing that is very telling to me is when I just go to the tool's website and see if the site itself is even put together in a professional way. Um, so even something like a spelling or grammar error can sort of tip me off that maybe people are not paying attention to the details. Um, I'll also look to see if they've got a couple of good explainer videos or tutorials on YouTube. And by watching those, that can help to give you a very, very quick idea of how the tool works. If they have nothing like that, that's also to me a red flag that the support for users might not be all that great. Um, I would yeah. especially be looking for things like case studies and that sort of thing. And then, you know, it's very, very helpful for the tool to have a free trial or even just a, a free option for teachers so that you can just try it. A lot of times I will just make a, a teacher account and make some fake student accounts and just start playing around with how this thing works. But um, really the first question I ask myself is, is you know, what, what will this tool actually do? Is, is, there, is this going to replace something that I'm already doing? Is it going to make something better? Because some, some tools, there's a lot of tech out there right now that is just there to sort of babysit and feed content into kids' brains. There's just so much where it's just like, Lots and lots and lots of math practice problems or lots and lots of reading passages where students just answer questions and click over and over again. And I just, I don't see that those are doing a whole lot for improving <laughs> students or, yeah. or making them more creative or, or higher level thinkers or anything like that. And so it, it helps to really think about what benefit it's going to give you and your students. Well, it sort of brings me to a question that I have in my own mind about when you, you know, in certain areas, we have uh, dominant systems in place, whether it's Adobe or, or whatever it might be that is almost mm -hmm. has, that is a skill set that students will use later on, maybe as they go, as they go into careers and so on. And you have that on one side, and then you have these popping up wonderful new tools sometimes that look and sometimes operate a lot better, but maybe don't have the support behind them so they may be better but may die from just lack of traction. And sort of how do you balance that idea of do I go with what I know is already there as opposed to this really great tool here? Oh, that is, that is such, a, such a good question. You know, huh. I mean, the thing is, the advantage that I have is because I am not full-time in the classroom, I've got time to play around with things. And teachers don't really have that time. So you end up having to just maybe go on personal recommendations or try things out in the summer. But I, I would always be a little bit suspicious about a company that is trying to be all things to all people, which is why I love the pop-up tools sometimes because they stay in one lane and they say we're going to do this one thing really well instead of companies that say, oh, we have an LMS and now we have you know a whole body of content that suddenly is going to appear that's going to give students everything they need to learn and now we've got this other piece here, and it's just I understand everybody wanting to be able to streamline things onto one platform, but sometimes I think some companies are trying to stretch too far, and then I think quality is going to suffer when they do that. Okay. All right. Well, it's, uh, that is a fair approach to it all. Uh, yeah, we have uh, – there's just one question that came through. It, it might be – I hope maybe you've not even heard of it. Someone's asking about a product called Padlet. P-A-D-L-E-T, to curate. Do you know about Padlet, and do you have any thoughts about I it? I do. I do. I do. I love Padlet. Um, I, the thing that I love about Padlet, and for anybody who's, who's not familiar with it, it you imagine just a, a cork board online, a blank bulletin board that you can literally sort of pin things onto. Um, what's nice about Padlet is that it's really flexible. You can move things literally all around the screen and stick them in different places. I find Padlet to be almost better for um, collaboration with other people. So if a group of people is going to collect, you know, let's all put our favorite books, you know, in education there or something like that, it's, it's a good place to collect with other people. It can get a little messy. <laughs> um, I feel like yeah. it could evolve a little bit more into something that's a little bit visually easier to look at. But, yeah, I think Padlet is a great tool. Okay. All right. Well, I, sadly, we have run through our entire hour, um, and there were some other questions that we didn't get a chance to, to, to get to. 
So if you did ask a question that we didn't answer, um, someone from the It's Learning team will follow up with you to get you some answers. Um, and so as we wrap up, uh, I just want to thank you, Jennifer, uh, for an excellent presentation, a really, a really uh, very, very compelling. And I also want to, on behalf of eSchool Media, I'd like to thank It's Learning for its support today. And a final reminder, and I know a lot of you in the audience were asking about this, we will be sending out an email to everyone in the audience uh, when the recording of the webinar is ready so that you can uh, replay it and at, at your convenience. So that concludes our webcast for today. Thank you again, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>